Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato, and welcome to Te Whare Wananga o Waitaha, the University of Canterbury, for this somewhat unusual edition of UC Connect's public lecture series. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about the smallest worlds in planetary systems, what we know about them, what we know about where they've come from, and what they can tell us about the formation of and evolution of planetary systems here and across the galaxy. The way that planetary systems begin is the story of how our own home, our own Earth, comes to be. It begins in darkness. It begins in the endless night. And from there, we go into Te Ao Mama, the world of light. Our own world is but a moat in a sunbeam, seen from one of our spacecraft so far out into the outermost reaches of our solar system, it becomes only a point of light. The formation of planetary systems, the formation that leads to places like our own world, begins itself in darkness. And these birthplaces of new planets, we can now see with a, space, with a, a telescope called ALMA. This observatory allows us to look with light that is not at the wavelengths that we see with our own eyes. It's in the sub-millimeter wavelengths. And this longer wavelength light lets us see dust that's the same wavelength as the light. It sees dust the size of the dust bunnies that you get under your sofa. The size of dust, dust that is the size of grains of sand. And when we look at forming planetary systems around other stars, you can see disks disks around these stars of gas and dust, and they're channeled, they're curved by the arcs of what we think seem to be linked to the formation of planets. These birth places of new planets are not, they're, they're short-lived. They don't last particularly long. They last maybe a few million years at most, and then we see fully-fledged planetary systems around other stars. And we see many planetary systems Every star that you can see with your eyes in the night sky probably has at least one planet. That's what we have the idea of the amount of planets that we have in our galaxy from looking in sky surveys at um, stars all across the galaxy. Our galaxy is filled with planets. And so when you look at these birthplaces of new planets, you're seeing the beginning stages of a process that's gone on billions of years, not just millions. This process happens pretty fast. The gas and dust disperse. And the later stages that happen mean that planetary systems end up losing most of the tiny worlds that they make. The process of turning that disk of gas and dust into planetesimals, the building blocks of the big planets, makes trillions on trillions of these tiny worlds. And Think about it here on the scale of our own solar system. So here I'm showing you a simulation. What happens if you put down planetesimals in the disk that's round and flat? So on the lower part here, this is their eccentricity, the shapes of their orbits. They start as circles. On the top part here, we have their inclinations, how much they're tilted relative to the plane. They start round and flat. But look what happens to these little worlds when you start to move Neptune in amongst them. Hundreds of thousands, then millions, then billions, then even trillions are thrown out of our solar system in the process that leads to the migration of planets, the sculpting of our planetary system into the architecture, into the shape of where we see the giant planets orbiting today where we see Neptune orbiting today. Some of them remain. Some of these are the little worlds that live out beyond Pluto. Pluto is one of their bigger cousins. These are the worlds of the outer solar system, trapped in resonances with Neptune. But the most effective thing that a planetary system can do is that it produces wanderers between the stars. Planetary systems aren't just good at making planets. They're far more effective at making interstellar objects. And the 
this process, we think, as far as we can tell, is going to happen across the galaxy. Now, I've talked about what can happen in the first part of a system's lifetime, in these first few millions to hundreds of millions of years, through the part, maybe up to a few hundreds of millions of years, early in system lifetime still. Then you end up with a situation where the planetary system, its star, is in its kind of gentle middle age, and this goes for billions of years, like our own system is at the moment. And during this time, you have the Oort cloud of comets, the tiny trapped fraction, that 1 to 5% of planetesimals out in the Oort cloud making our comets. Even that will be tugged at by the tides of the galaxy itself. A few comets will be stripped off to go and wander the galaxy, just as much as occasionally we get a comet coming in near our sun. And then at the end of the star's lifetime, when it turns into a white dwarf, into a husk, a little ember of a star. That Oort cloud of comets will just slowly unbind and ribbon away. And you'll end up with all of those leftover planetary objects will end up wandering the galaxy as well. So planetary systems are really effective at making interstellar objects. And they just wander off, traveling between the stars like cosmic driftwood. We're in, in an era now where we've seen some of these worlds ourselves, where we've been able to see the ones that happened to wander between the stars and come through our own solar system, through our own planetary system. And when they come close enough, we can see these in exactly the same way that we observe asteroids, that we observe comets, that we observe trans-Neptunian objects in our own system. We can spot these little worlds that they don't belong to our sun's family by the paths they take. They travel in on orbits that aren't bound to the sun, hyperbolic orbits, orbits that take them through the solar system and out again, off to wander until they perhaps encounter some other star. And they travel fast. These things have much higher velocities than a comet from the Oort cloud dropping in. The way we detect these is with sky surveys. These are our eyes for being able to survey across and see what changes in the night sky. They repeatedly image the sky, different observatories all around the world. This one, the Pan Stars Observatory um, on Haleakala in Hawaii. And these observatories look for things that change. Sometimes things that change are exploding stars, supernovae. Sometimes what you see is the arc of a moving object. And just sometimes that moving object is an interstellar object. So the first of these was seen by PANSTARS, by this telescope, in October 2017. And it came from the direction on the sky that the sun is traveling around the galaxy. And it did a hairpin turn around the sun, it came conveniently close to Earth for us to observe it, and headed right back on out again. And we were able to do observations of this in exactly the same way we can do for worlds in our own system. We can compare it. We can say, how is this actually different? Is this little world from another star, is it actually going to have a history that's like what we see in our own system? Or is it going to be something that's completely different? Well, fortunately, we were making observations with this telescope, the Gemini North Observatory on Mauna Kea and with the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, its next door neighbor. And we had this survey going to be able to study the surfaces of outer solar system objects, trans-Neptunian worlds. Now, these worlds are good because they don't have material coming off their surface very much. You can see their surface directly. You can see how their icy surfaces have changed under an unyielding rain of cosmic radiation over billions of years. They're reddish surfaces. But we had no idea when we saw Oumuamua, the first interstellar object, what was it going to be like? A lot of people had thought and the first interstellar object we were going to see was probably going to be something like a comet, something like this with an amazing tail and 
huge coma of material sublimating off its surface as those ices get heated for the first time in billions of years and flow out into space. Now this is a solar system comet. The reason we thought interstellar objects might be comet-like is there's just more volume in a planetary system that's cold, that's far away from its star. So there's more places for small icy worlds to condense than there is for rocky worlds. So just on numbers alone, every star that donates its planetesimals out to the cosmos is going to send out more comets than it does rocks. So surely if you pick one at random, the first one that we see, it's going to be a comet-like thing, something fuzzy when you see it through a telescope. Well, the first interstellar object, Oumuamua, the messenger arriving from afar in Hawaii, does not look visibly cometary. It's a point source. It's a unresolved dot of light. And it's tiny. It's, you know, about the size of a skyscraper. This is a very small little world. And you can see it here with the Gemini North Telescope, 300 ton observatory, is moving like a ballerina to track this fast moving object as it zips past the Earth. What's moving it? Well, it's just traveling like a piece of driftwood. But because there's no coma, because there's no cloaking material around it coming off its surface that we can see in these observations, we can compare its surface directly to what we see in the outer solar system. We can compare the life history of something that formed in another star to the life history of the worlds we see here. So let me show you what this looks like, putting together these optical and these near-infrared observations. I'm going to show you how this works in the space of light that we see with our eyes along this side and light that you would see in the near infrared, what we feel is heat a little more along this axis. And if you think of color, these, these two different colors in what your eyes see and, what, and in the near infrared, the sun is a warm glow down in that corner there. For different asteroid populations that we see in the solar system, they're pretty tightly clumped. The asteroids form a tight group near the, the color of the sun, there's two groups of asteroids that orbit out near Jupiter, the Trojans of Jupiter that orbit before and behind Jupiter in its orbit. And they have two groups of colors. One is a lot like asteroids, and the other is much redder. If you go even further out from the sun, the trans-Neptunian objects, on the other hand, they have a really wide range of colors. The trans-Neptunian colors go all the way from being asteroid-like to some of the reddest surfaces that we see in the solar system. So where's Oumuamua going to form? What does an interstellar object look like in these color spaces? Well, it turns out Oumuamua is not like an asteroid. It could be like a Jupiter Trojan, but it's very much like a trans-Neptunian object. It's like maybe a dried out comet, a little icy husk that has traveled between the stars. It's kin to the worlds that we see in our own system. It's not that different, not in its color. The light curve got really confusing. So a light curve is the change in brightness that we see when we monitor one of these objects over time. And Oumuamua's light curve varied incredibly. So this was telescopes all around the world trying to observe this object through the 10 days that we could see it really well before it got too far from Earth and even the largest ground-based and space-based telescopes were having trouble seeing it. So we had 10 days of really good quality photometry and it changed in brightness a lot during this time. And some of this is just shape, as far as we can tell. If you see something that's side on, you see more of its surface. If you see end on, you're seeing less of its surface. Side on, you see more of it. End on, you see less of it. And so the kind of shape that can produce a light curve like this one is something that's, well, that's pretty elongated, basically. A more and more makes a very nice version of long cat. Now this seemed amazingly weird in 2017. But there was a spacecraft that fixed that. 
New Horizons flew past the primordial world on the edge of our solar system, now known as Arrakos. And this little world is on one of those round, flat orbits that I was mentioning earlier. It's a trans-Neptunian object. It's something that formed in the, in the planetary disk and has never moved its orbit very far from where it formed. And when you look at it here, it doesn't have many craters. There's very few craters evident on the surface. And craters are important because they tell us about the impacts that have happened to this, how much the surface has been pummeled and had collisions. Arrakos is pretty free of craters. What is weird about it is its shape. The shape model for this that we see from the New Horizons images flying past it and also from the observations that were made here of Earth, here on Earth, of how Arrakos moved in front of stars, blocking out their light. Those occultation measurements together with this show that it's basically these two lobes. They're not big round balls. They're really flattened. Arrakos is basically two chunky pancakes dopped together. This was not something that was really predicted when people started to do how planetesimals form out of disks. This is something that was a surprise. And this flattened pita bread, overstuffed pita bread kind of shape is something that turned out to be remarkably similar to how you can think about Oumuamua. I was able to work with this very fun group of people over the last two years to put together a study of what we think Oumuamua might look like, from the colours to the, the uh, measurements of its surface that were made, to the shape and how that can be interpreted from the light curve measurements that we have. And well, Oumuamua is basically, you know, it's small, it's a skyscraper sized, it has a fluffy surface, comets are very weakly surfaced objects, they have incredibly low density. It's either a tumbling space cucumber or maybe more like a stuffed pita bread. And we have objects exactly that weird in our own system. It could be very much like one of the lobes of Arakoth. Now there was some surprise when we saw this object going past because the trajectory that it took through space, the the way that we measured this is by tracking its path across the sky and seeing how that altered over time. And there was a very slight alteration in this path. This is pretty normal for comets. Comets do this a lot. And it has a really cool technical name, which is a non-gravitational acceleration. The thing is, comets do it a lot because they're outgassing, they're subliming material. The tiny non-gravitational acceleration that Oumuamua did as it went past the sun is equal to the skyscraper subliming an amount of ice that's less than a millimeter thick across its surface. It's a suitcase of ice, which is pretty reasonable when you think about heating an entire skyscraper. So yeah, Oumuamua is many things, not aliens. The really cool part about Oumuamua is that it made us think how many of them there are. And we live in a galaxy where there are a lot of little Oumuamua friends. I can describe the way that these, uh, cluster, that these uh, float through space in many ways. Probably the most way that relates is to think about it as at any point, right now, Inside the orbit of Mars, there's probably something about as big as Oumuamua. There's about 10 to the 15 of these little worlds per cubic parsec. That's the implications of having a galaxy where planetary systems make planetesimals and scatter them out going beyond. Now, this sounds like a lot of mass. It's not. Galaxies are enormous, incredibly massive places. The bright froth on them of stars and clouds of gas and dust that are the birthplaces of new stars are incredibly more massive. And the amount of dark matter in a galaxy, again, is incredibly more massive, even beyond all of the bright froth of baryonic matter that makes this up. So these are not important in their mass. They're important in their numbers. 
And so I've been having a lot of fun thinking about what are the implications of this? What does it mean that our galaxy is filled with flying rocks? What does it mean that when you look at the night sky, you don't just see a, a world where we live in a galaxy that's bright stars, dark dust lanes. Up in that sky, there are trillions on trillions that you can't see with your naked eyes, but are there of tiny little rocks. One of the ideas I've been exploring is how this works when these products of generations of planetary systems interact with forming planetary systems. Now, a molecular cloud like this, an incredibly sparse place of gas and dust, forms beautiful nebula. But it's also the birthplace of new stars. And so I've been working with colleagues Suzanne Fausner and others in um, Europe and here at the University of Canterbury to explore this idea of when molecular clouds collapse, that they can scoop up. The, molecular, the interstellar objects that happen to be passing through them at the time. There's also other ways that you can get these large objects, you know, skyscraper sized, into new planetary systems, which otherwise are just this fine gas and dust. You can catch them in the disks themselves. And if Jeannie Grishin collaborators have been looking at this idea that the disks themselves can act as tiny little flypaper, enough to be able to trap a few tens or few hundreds of interstellar objects as they pass through. So where does this idea lead you? Well, what do we end up with? Do we, end, we can think about it as maybe planetary systems form planetary systems. The way you get later generations of planetary systems catalyzed across the galaxy, the way you speed up their evolution and formation, is by adding the interstellar objects that the first generations formed. Now, this doesn't let you have the first planetesimals in the galaxy. What it does is let you speed up the way that planet formation happens after a few disks across the galaxy end up catalyzing their planetesimals. And you can think about this on an even larger scale. Galaxy mergers are a major part of how galaxies form and evolve and grow. All of the work on this thinks about how you add the dark matter and the baryonic matter, the bright stars and the um, gas and dust together. But they're also going to merge their populations of interstellar objects. How will we know when we next see an interstellar object if it's actually an intergalactic object? A planetesimal that formed not just at another star in our galaxy, but maybe even further afield. The nice part is, we don't just have one of these now that we're trying to guess about how all this goes together. We have two. And a sample of two, as any astronomer will happily tell you, is always better than when you have a sample of one. This is Comet 2i, Interstellar 2, and it's named for its discoverer, Gennady Borisov. You can see it here, um, as seen by a slightly larger telescope than Gennady's home-built telescope that he, found, that he found this comet with. And this isn't a point source. This object is much more fuzzy. This is a proper, honest-to-goodness comet. So if we'd seen this one first, maybe we would have thought interstellar objects behave exactly as we expected. But because we got Oumuamua first, we end up having to rethink our assumptions a little bit, having to think more deeply about how planetary systems form and evolve, having to think, how do you get a world that's like Oumuamua as well as something that's like Borisov? The nice part here, while we can't see the surface of this object directly, we can do something much more detailed than we could with Oumuamua. We can look at its chemistry. That coma, the light from that coma, we can split it up with a spectrograph. And that lets us look at the chemical fingerprint of that gas to see how the fingerprint of the chemistry subliming off its surface is imprinted onto the light. And this is in the, um, the near ultraviolet part of the wavelength. And you can see this lovely, strong emission feature 
at this very particular wavelength. And this is the wavelength that corresponds to the fingerprint of cyanogen, the CN molecule. And cyanogen is lovely because we see this all the time in solar system comets. This is a really common solar system comet molecule. So maybe this means that body solvers very much like what we saw in the solar system. Well, we found, this one was found by um, Gennady Borisov in um, late last year. But the nice part was, this one was a lot more leisurely. We could see this by many telescopes as Borisov made a much more gentle arc past the sun, staying outside the orbit of Mars the whole way. So it never got as close to us as Oumuamua. But we have the advantage that we could see it for an awful lot longer. And so we had space telescopes like SWIFT, which observes it in the ultraviolet, and Hubble Space Telescope, which took this image that you see on the right, this sequence over time, and uh, um, has also been looking at with, uh, um, its spectrographs as well. And we've been looking with all different ground-based telescopes in many, many wavelengths. And this alphabet soup of different telescopes and instrumentation here gives you some idea that you know, the concerns of the world's astronomers who study small planetary bodies have been very focused on trying to go, what can we say about the chemistry of this world? Now, it wouldn't have come from the same system as Oumuamua. The trajectories are completely different. The length of time they've been traveling through the galaxy could be completely different. But we can compare them. And one of the projects that I've um, been involved with that I kind of want to walk you through a little bit more here is with an instrument on the Very Large Telescope in Chile. And this is an instrument with an acronym called MUSE. And MUSE is enormous. <laughs> this is an integral field spectrograph. So it doesn't just split up the light that you see along a single line. For an image like the one that you see back here, this image um, of Borisov with the fuzzy coma, every single image component that you see in that image, every pixel becomes a spectra. So MUSE is a very powerful instrument. It can basically make a cube of image through a whole set of different wavelengths in the wavelengths of light that you can see with your eyes and a little bit either side. Now MUSE is pretty big. It's on the VLT. Um, so there are four very large telescopes in Chile. This is UT4, the number four of them. And MUSE um, occupies this entire side port here. You can kind of just see the tangles of the octopus aspects of it. And so we've been making a campaign of measurements as Borisov came past the sun to be able to study its changing composition in detail. But if I show you a um, part of the spectra uh, that's very similar to the kinds of measurements I was showing you earlier. So I showed you one that was in the, near, in the ultraviolet. This is now in optical light. So this is going from kind of 920 nanometers, bluer, 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 all the way to about 480 nanometers. And there's all kinds of emission features here. Now this telescope, you know, it's on Earth. So we get what are called tellurics, the fingerprints of the water in Earth's atmosphere um, on this light. But we also see what's known as the swan bands of something called diatomic carbon, C2, a little molecule of carbon that's flowing off this comet as it sublimes, as it's heated up by the light of the sun. And we also see multiple emission features of NH2. And NH2 is a fun one because this is a daughter product. This is what happens when ammonia, you know, a kitchen cleaning chemical that you might find under your sink, it's frozen on a comet like this. And when it gets heated, it breaks apart under the influence of sunlight. And you see the fingerprint of its daughter molecule, NH2. So how strange is this comet? We have chemistry. We can compare it to the hundreds of solar system comets that have been measured over the past several, many decades to try and get a catalogue of what happens and what the chemistry is like in our own system. Well, Borisov is reasonably similar to a lot of solar system comets in its diatomic carbon. But the NH2 is really enriched. This comet 
was forming in a disk where we have maybe one comet in our own solar system sample that has anything like the NH2 enrichment that we see in body self. And we did some other work with the SWIFT satellite, with Hubble Space Telescope, and um, that result was confirmed by another team's work with the ALMA Observatory observing this comet, that there's lots of carbon monoxide in this comet, way more than solar system comets. It's, again, like one comet that has similar amounts of CO. So putting all of this together, what was the home system of Borisov like? We think at the moment, myself and my co collaborators on these papers, that the star that Borisov formed at is probably redder and cooler than our own sun. It's something like an M dwarf, the most common star that you see in the galaxy. And Borisov would have formed in the outer reaches of, this di of the disk of forming planetesimals where there was a lot of room for cold icy molecules to form. Because the thing about carbon monoxide is that as an ice, it, takes a l it needs to stay incredibly cold to, be, to stick around. If it heats up, it's gone. It sublimes really, really early as, it, as it comets come into the sun. So for Borisov to still have its carbon monoxide, it's had to stay cold for a long time. But because M dwarfs are cooler stars, they have more disk that's cold. So maybe Borisov's home system was somewhere quite different to our own. Now the nice part is, we have two. But I've just been talking about how we don't have a galaxy that's filled with two interstellar objects. We have a galaxy that's filled with trillions on trillions on trillions of interstellar objects. So what's the chance another one comes visiting? Well. There's a spacecraft for that. We have a mission called Comet Interceptor, which has been put together over the last year by myself and some amazing collaborators in Europe, um, led by um, Geraint Jones and Colin Snodgrass in the UK. And this amazing team of people, over 100 of them, have been putting together a mission concept that will launch in 2028. And this is known as a fast mission because you have to put the concept together quickly. It turned out that the European Space Agency's Aerial Exoplanet Telescope, when they put it, figured out how it was going to fit in the rocket in the Ariane, they had some room. And the room was about the size of a coffee table and you know, a few hundred kilograms of mass. And so the idea was with the fast class mission call, what do you do with the space? Here's some space, here's some mass. Go. What can you think of that would be really fun? And so we thought about, what if you could go and visit an interstellar object or a dynamically new comet, one that's dropping in from the Oort cloud for the very first time, being heated for the very first time since it was formed? So this is the Comet Interceptor mission. We got selected from 28 other mission candidates and. It's now in phase A development with the European Space Agency as we try and figure out all the details of how to make spacecraft design very, very quickly. This is an international collaboration at the moment, but I'll tell you a little more about Comet Interceptor first. The fun part about this mission is that it launches along with the aerial spacecraft, and then it sits out at the Lagrange 2 point out beyond the moon and it waits, and it can sit there patiently, balancing on this little gravitational balancing spot that is L2, where the gravitational force is perfectly balanced to allow it to sit there without having to burn fuel. And then when a comet or interstellar object zooms in at just the right point that it can fire the thrusters, it can go and pounce, and we can send the spacecraft across where it will cruise over to the comet and be able to intercept it. We don't have a very complicated mission name. How does this work? Well, when the little coffee table gets near the comet, it turns out to have two subspacecraft in it. So we have a, a mother spacecraft and two um, subspacecraft. The mother spacecraft and one of the daughter spacecraft is being built by the European Space Agency, and the other daughter spacecraft is being built by the Japanese Space Agency. And so 
this will give us multi-point measurements of the comet. So you'll have three different views of what's going on as the material shedding off this comet for the first time interacts with the wind from the sun. All of this plasma interaction has never been studied before from multiple angles. And we'll be able to see the comet from different angles, seeing how it changes as it's heated up. This will be a fast flyby. We're going past this pretty quick. This thing is moving at a good clip. But this is something where we can see something truly unknown, a comet from multiple angles at once. And so these three little spacecraft are being put together by a really big international collaboration. This is, this is how spacecraft work, is they're incredibly international. We all come together to figure out, here's a piece of hardware that we can build, here's something, hey, you have a component, I have a camera, you've got a plasma sensor, let's make spacecraft, right? It's a party and everyone brings their bit. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm really excited with uh, um, as a new lecturer at the University of Canterbury is the idea that maybe we can have New Zealand be part of this effort as well. On my to-do list. The thing about Comet Interceptor, though, is I haven't told you which interstellar object or dynamically new comet this mission's going to go to. That's because the amazing thing about Comet Interceptor is we don't have a mission target. We are going to something that has not been discovered yet. But fortunately, there's a survey for that. The Vera Rubin Observatory is seen only a few days ago under the full moon at its construction site here in Chile. It's going to con conduct a survey that's called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST. And this telescope is an eight meter telescope and it's going to be able to image the whole southern sky every three nights. It's going to do it in six colors. It's going to give us a decade-long movie of how the sky changes as seen from the Southern Hemisphere over this time. This amazing observatory, I've been doing a fair bit of planning and uh, trying to see what we'll be able to discover with it and how we can make this survey. And it's going to really change the way that we think about the solar system. At the moment, we have you know, barely 3,000 known little worlds out beyond Neptune, Pluto and its cousins. We have some eight to 900,000 known asteroids in the inner part of the solar system. LSST is going to take that up to more than six million known small worlds in the solar system. And it's also going to be really sensitive to interstellar objects, which it detects just the same way as it finds moving objects in the solar system. With luck, we should be able to find an interstellar object each year over the next decade. So we'll go from knowing not just two interstellar objects in more than 20 years of surveying, but have one coming that can be studied every year. Because this observatory is so much larger a mirror than the size of mirrors that have been used for wide field sky surveys in the past, that it's gonna be transformative. In the next couple of years, this is aimed to start first light in either two to three years, we're going to have a solar system that is completely different than the one that we think about now. We hope. At the moment, there is a constellation of satellites being launched um, called Starlink. And the effect of this constellation of satellites is transforming the night sky because these satellites are very bright. They orbit low, you know, only a few hundred kilometers above the Earth. And this means they reflect the sunlight in a way that you can see with your own eyes. And if you can see it with your eyes, an eight meter telescope can see a lot more of it. <laughs> So this is the kind of image that you see from a four meter telescope in Chile. And the one on the, um, over the other side there is from the Lowell Observatory in North America. LSST is currently expecting at least 30% of its images to contain at least one satellite trail 
from the constellation as it's fully expected to be. These satellites are launching pretty rapidly. They launch 60 every couple of weeks as the anticipated delivery. And when you see them with your own eyes, they look kind of like a string of little dots moving across the sky after the, um, in, the, in the few weeks after they've more recently been launched. And they space out a bit more after they've moved into their permanent altitude. Now, I noticed this from the perspective of how it affected LSST. But the question for this is much bigger. What do we want our night skies to look like? How much technology do we want to have visible compared to the natural landscape? Because this is something that is being launched from America under American regulations, but it affects everyone on the planet. Here in New Zealand, because of our latitude, our relatively southern latitude, we're going to see quite a lot of these because of the way their orbits around the Earth are shaped. We actually get quite a lot. So we're going to have, you know, depending how the brightness of these things evolves, we're going to have tens of these visible higher in the sky at any given time and a lot more around the horizon and especially at twilight which is quite often when most people go and have a look at the night sky so why the decision point in how we think about the natural environment how do we want it to change and evolve the near earth environment is an environment like any part of our planet and it's up to us how we think about what we should do in terms of its guardianship, its stewardship, and its development. Planetary systems are amazing places. We know and love them for Papatuanuku, for our own world, for the planets that we see in the night sky, the planets that we can send spacecraft to, and for planetary systems all across the galaxy. But they're not just effective at making planets. They're very effective at making interstellar wanderers, tiny worlds that go out and travel between the stars. We've had two that we know of that we've been able to observe with our um, best ground-based and space-based telescopes and tell us about the chemistry of their home systems. Some of them, their aspects are similar to what we see here. Some of them are really different. Some of their home stars may be very different from the placid little waters that we see in our own cosmic backyard. But we're going to have more of these. We're going to have a transformative number of them discovered in the coming decade. And that's going to tell us about how planetary formation happened all across the galaxy. These are little worlds from other stars, and they come right to our doorstep. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. For those watching on the live stream, um, if you could just submit your questions on the comments below, we'll wait a couple of seconds because of um, the delay, and Michelle will be happy to answer them. In the meantime, I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> Please. What's the difference between interstellar objects and inter intergalactic objects? I wish we knew. <laughs> right, so this gets down to in a different galaxy, how does star formation work? Now that's something that we can observe a little bit because we can see generations of star formation happening in other galaxies, but we haven't been able to see the details of planet formation happening in other galaxies because that's just such a small scale when a galaxy is so far away that we can't resolve it. But this could offer a way to sample that because you have these pieces of that planet formation that have actually come to be part of our own interstellar population. So I don't know what the uh, um, chemical compositions are going to be like that would tell us it's intergalactic. That's an active area of research. But I am really looking forward to finding out what the answer is. Okay, we've got some questions coming through. Um, Hugh said, hi Michelle, have you ever seen any evidence of other life forms by chance when looking at collected data? 
At the moment, we don't know of any environments that have life outside of our own planet. Our own planet has an incredibly diverse range of life. What we can do looking out across our solar system and, uh, and exoplanetary systems is look for environments that are what is termed habitable. And this has a very specific technical meaning, and it means an environment that would support chemistry in a way that would allow reactions to happen and continue. So that sounds kind of technical, but something that you could think of as being a good habitable environment would be a salty ocean in contact with a rocky core, where the rock gives you chemical elements and the salty water allows reactions to happen. And it happens that in our solar system, we have a few of these. We have ice moons, huge thick ice shells with liquid salty oceans underneath and rocky, planet, rocky cores to those worlds. Europa, Enceladus, Titan, there are a whole, maybe even Pluto. We don't know for sure, but we know at some point in its history, Pluto probably had an ocean. Whether it has one today is still an open question. So we have habitable environments in our own system. You know, and also, you know, Mars <laughs> is a popular one for thinking about whether there could have been a past habitable environment there. So we have many very interesting places to think about where environments that life could exist can be, in, even in our own system. What we don't yet know is whether any of them do. Thank you. Cool. Sarah said, um, Dr. Sarah Kessens actually, has said, what Hi, space <laughs> missions would you like to see New Zealand pursue? I would totally like to see us create a space mission. And this is a really exciting time. We are at a point in our country's history where we can put together a space mission. So, ooh, which one would I like to do first? Well, Rocket Labs has a photon platform which can potentially launch, I think, somewhere in the region of 15 to 25 kilograms of mass into orbits towards either, say, the moon or a near-Earth asteroid or maybe even as far as Venus. That would be fun. We could go measure lightning on Venus. We could send a spacecraft to go to a near-Earth asteroid and pick a piece up and see what it's made of. I think there's a lot of possibilities. Cool. Uh, Nikki would like to know why, why are many of the telescopes based in Chile? The mountains in Chile are, so the, the things that you want for an observatory is to have very clear air, very stable air, so the stars don't twinkle, and you want clear skies, night after night after night. And there's only a few places in the world that have these characteristics. Chile, the mountains of Chile in particular, certain spots in them, have very stable air, ad abundant clear skies, because the air coming off the Pacific rises up to the Andes and makes a smooth flow over it. So um, La Silla, Cerro Paranal, um, Cerro Tololo, these are the sites that have been um, developed as astronomical observatories in the past. Awesome. Um, Andy would like to know, do you think that really massive stars like your white and blue giants start to form planetary systems even given their limited lifespans? We don't know yet. So this is a really good open question in terms of how do planetary systems form around stars of different masses? And trying to understand whether um, stars of the mass of our sun, your kind of smaller, quieter stars and M dwarf stars, which are even smaller and quieter again, all the way up to your bright, dazzling giants. Do planetary systems exist across that whole mass range? That's something people are working really actively on. And I think one of the space missions that's going to help with this is a mission called TESS, which is looking at bright stars that in the, um, it's done the southern hemisphere sky and it's working on the northern hemisphere sky. It's monitoring those stars and watching to see if they change in brightness. And they bright, 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 dip. And that dip would be the signature of a planet passing in front of the star and blocking out its light. So I think that's going to help with answering the question of do blue um, and white giants of, of those much larger masses and shorter lifetimes, do they have planetary systems the like what we see elsewhere? Thank you. Uh, Alyssa would like to know, what are the relative chances of one of these interstellar or intergalactic objects containing some form of alien biology? 
I think it's incredibly unlikely, right? It is a fun idea to go, hey, if there's life in this system, then this asteroid goes off this way and it wanders the galaxy and then it comes back and it holds that life. It's fun and it's good to have ideas. Ideas are great. The trick is to take your idea and go, what makes it plausible? So if you look at when planetesimals form in these disks, they're doing it very early and there's just gas and dust and you have radiation from the star on the outer material of the disk, so that can sterilize anything. You know, if you want, if you think of organic molecules in that sense, it would sterilize a lot of those. In the mid plane of the disk, where perhaps you get more planetesimal formation happening because the dust is a bit denser, it's not as irradiated, so that's a nicer environment. But this isn't an environment where you have. Um, habitable conditions taking place. It's frozen for the most part. You have ice molecules on these uh, grains of sand. So this is an, env an environment that you would think about as being good for habitable conditions to set up. So I think, honestly, I think the, the idea that any of these objects would move astrobiology is really pretty low at this point. Shane would like to know, does the rotation of object change the deeper in space you go? Okay, if, um, so I, th I, th I think I see what you're getting at here. Um, does the rotation of something like an interstellar object change if it's in a different part of the galaxy? Um, not as far as I would know. So one of the ideas for Oumuamua's formation um, Sean, Sean Raymond and uh, uh, Matt Cook and others have been talking about this idea that you would have tidal shredding of a planetesimal. So something like a comet would come in close to a planet or close to its star and the tidal forces from that interaction would rip it apart into shreds. And then it would be thrown out of the planetary system and go off to wander until it came past us. And this is what gives it the unusual shape. This is one idea for how to get an unusual shape. A spin that's exerted to that object in the process of that happening would be pretty stable over the length of time it would travel between the stars. We, um, a paper led by Alan Fitzsimmons uh, um, back when Oumuamua was first found looked at that and uh, um, one led by Wes Fraser um, a month or two later also looked at that and yeah, the, the spin rates stay pretty stable as they travel the galaxy. Keep sending your questions through just on the comment on the live stream if you've just tuned in. Um, David would like to know, uh, will the new telescope, I'm assuming he's talking about the yeah, Legacy see. Telescope, help with detecting dangerous asteroids? Yeah, so Vera Rubin Observatory, one of its primary missions is to be able to map out the solar system. And part of that is being able to map out the population of asteroids that are on orbits that could cross that of Earth. And these potentially hazardous asteroids, the ones that could come close enough to even go closer than the orbit of the moon, uh, those ones are ones that we really want to be able to track and keep an eye on. Now, at the moment, no asteroids are known that are a hazard to Earth. But we keep watching and we keep measuring to make sure we have a good handle on the near-Earth asteroids, that we actually know where all of them are. This is celestial mechanics. We can predict where they move as long as we have found them and been able to track them for long enough to have a good quality orbit. And if we can do that, we can predict where they'll be in the future and make sure Earth is safe. One of the problems that we have with the um, effect on the night sky from the mega constellations is that twilight is a good time to be looking for near Earth asteroids. And uh, uh, because of the geometry between us here on Earth and the sun, and it's also a really good time to look for interstellar objects. Um, Gennady Borisov found 2i Borisov ahead of the other surveys, uh, ahead of the professional surveys, because he looked really close to the sun, where the professional surveys didn't want to like cook their telescopes. So we're worried at the moment about the impact these satellite constellations can have on the search for potentially hazardous asteroids. Oh, um, we've got a 
question here. Would it be plausible to assume that many of the stars we can see today may have already expired due to the time it takes for light to get to us? We do see a lot of stars that are in the, the um, different parts of their life cycle, but when you look up at the galaxy, you're seeing stars in all different parts of their life cycle. Right? We see stars forming, we, stars, we see stars that have just been born, shed their clouds of gas and dust. We see stars that are at the end of their lives as white dwarfs or as supernovae. So I wouldn't say most, no. I, we see stars, our, our galaxy in particular is still very much in its active star forming cycles. We've got a comment from Abby. Kia ora, Michelle. Nā mihi. Thank you for your incredibly interesting korero tonight. With the increase in the launch of these satellites, is there widespread knowledge that is happening? And what are some of the reactions to this? Uh, kia ora, Abby. I'm not sure if it's widespread. It's something that I think people are rapidly, I hope, becoming more aware of because it's something you can see with your own eyes. You go out and you can see these satellites moving across the sky. I don't think people have come to grips with how fast this is changing. This one company is currently launching most of the naked eye visible satellites that you can see from the whole world. Right? This is one company's effort. This is not the only company that is currently launching what will become mega constellations. OneWeb, a UK company, just went bankrupt after having launched 30 of their satellites for part of a planned larger constellation. Amazon wants to do one. There are also various national efforts to do ones. So this isn't just about one company. This is about a major change in the way that we think about our near-Earth environment and how we interact with it. And so I'm hoping people start to think about this as a conversation we need to have rapidly. Because at the moment, SpaceX plans to have 1,500 of these satellites launched within the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, Wayne would like to know what speed were the two objects, objects travelling through, sorry, what speed were the two discovered objects travelling through our system at? So Oumuamua was travelling at a velocity relative to infinity of about 30 and a bit kilometres per second and Borisov was travelling at a velocity of about 33 kilometres per second. So very much not bound to the sun. Cool, that's the end of our questions. Now mihi nui and thank you very much folks. <laughs>